Hey, insiders. Have you ever wondered what opportunities exist for your songs in the global marketplace? Well, if you have, then you don't want to miss this episode with veteran music executive and music publisher, Vince DiGiorgio, president of Chapter 2 Productions. We sit down and discuss the growing international base for songwriters and music publishing in today's music market and much, much more. Coming right up. This episode of the Mubu TV Insider Video Series is brought to you by the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 30 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Guide, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Hi, we're coming back to you live from Muse Expo here in Hollywood. We managed to catch up with president of Chapter 2 Productions, Vince DiGiorgio. Vince, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. You know, you've been doing A&R and publishing for a long time. You come from an A&R background. I actually do. I mean, I started out as a club DJ and basically, you know, it was uh, tone arms to ears and uh, started a dance record label when I was in my early 20s called Power Records, which I still own to this day. And um, basically embarked on a A&R career and a songwriting career at the same time. So um, I did that and uh, until about 1990 dabbled in the publishing world a little bit and then went to work for the majors because I felt it would be a good time to spend their money rather than always spending my own. <laughs> um, so I worked for a BMG, uh, now Sony Music, I guess, for those people who are following today's current major labels. And uh, I was lucky enough to come to New York to work for um, uh, RCA. And I was there for five years until I went back into, I guess, civilian life of being a, a pure independent in 2002. What inspired the change to go from the major life back into having your own company? There's nothing like being able to make your own decisions. You know, working and signing an artist like uh, in sync being an international A&R person, you know, you are surrounded by so many uh, different attributes that contribute to making a singular decision, whether it was a great manager like Johnny Wright or the uh, the upper echelon uh, A&R people that I, that I worked with, like Dave Novick and our president, Bob Jameson. It was really, really tough to, to work with them and alongside with the German company. So, you know, with our colleagues at BMG Munich at the time, we always had challenges. And I just felt that I had reached the summit. I mean, some people might want to sign a succession of artists, but having done it once and doing it right, within sync before they went from RCA to Jive, I just felt fulfilled. So I wanted to get back into writing songs again as well. So it seemed to be a natural transition. You now have Chapter 2 uh, Productions and you also have a music publishing company. And I, I know that, you know, the publishing world today of writing seems to operate on much more of a global level than it did in the past, where your writers and your cuts are coming from all different territories. Is this something that you've seen happen over the last 10 years, or has this always been the case for, for companies like yours? Well, it, it definitely is where we get our lifeblood. You know, Canada was a very uh, singer-songwriter, folklore, country type of closed musical society where the labels and A&R people which signed bands. 
And um, when I was working at RCA, because I actually started Chapter 2 before I joined RCA, um, I was allowed to continue to operate the company, and I was always looking to keep myself busy. So um, our first initial foray into foreign markets was actually in the mid-90s, um, because I felt that the markets were crowded. If you have 250,000, I'm giving you a ridiculous number, but if you have thousands of writers from all over the world moving to LA to converge on the society of, of creators and artists and publishers, you know, your chances of winning are going to be greatly diminished. Right. So in the case of, um, of myself, uh, I was really fascinated by the pure pop cycle of Japan, for example. So um, my first cuts there were at the end of the 90s, and it was because my assistant was actually a vocal coach for a Japanese pop superstar named Tomomi Kahara. And uh, I asked her, do they need songs? And she says, actually, they do. So... Um, the first single was written by my friend Andy Marvel, and I ended up getting two singles on her album, which basically introduced me to a whole new world. Um, I think the other thing, too, is that a song can be on hold in America back in those days or in Canada or the UK for a ridiculous amount of time. And I felt it would be better to help build a resume or, or a CV of cuts rather than have a list of holds, which means you have a frustrated writer, you have no movement, and you're basically not giving yourself a global chance to win if you're banking on one market. So that we've always been a very globally minded company. I think it may come back from when I was a kid and used to buy import records with shiny covers that all looked a lot sexier buying vinyl back then when I was, uh, you know, a preteen record collector. And uh, I just never lost the significance of wanting to know something different from another place, you know, much like when one of your baseball heroes goes to play in a, in a foreign country or an athlete, you know, right. same kind of correlation, I think. So can, can you tell us, Vince, are, are certain territories more open than others when it comes to writing and co-writing with uh, American writers or Canadian writers today than they were in the past? I think the doors are really open. You know, Simba, which is the main publishing company that houses the seven writers on our roster, is actually an acronym for crushing your music business apathy, which is kind of like a constant reminder that anything that you want to do, you can do if you, if you try. So, you know, um, I've written songs in Japan, for example, as far back as 2002, but I found that now the fear of the language is not as present in those sessions. People find the language of creation to be far uh, more important. You're seeing Canadian, Swedes, you know, Germans going to Korea to co-write and collaborate with people. Um, I think it's because the the generations of the current day, you know, in comparison to when I first started going over to Asia in 1999, those are completely different countries. The world is a lot smaller and um, the music world is a lot smaller and it's it's a lot more exciting. I mean, you know, the foundation of song pitching to foreign territories is the original record would be in English or or song, depending on what you want to call it. But now um, it's gone from just pitching English language songs or, you know, one of the other Japanese models, I guess, was having uh, David Foster, for example, or my friend Michael J writing songs for the Seiko Matsudas of the world, who is like, who is basically the, the megastar of all megastars forever and all time in Japan for the, from the pop female idol point of view. But, you know, you would also have the collaborations of, you know, people coming over to Los Angeles to record um, because they want a little bit more of mystique by recording outside of their own mm. countries. They would go to New York, they would go to Montreal, they would go to Sweden or London or something. But I think where it comes down to the open arms of collaboration, it's because there's now more like-minded publishing companies abroad that are willing to take the chance and say, no, you're not going to write something that sounds like a video game novelty. These people want to write 
big songs. I mean, the musicality and in a place like Japan, the, the, the fervent, uh, emotion in a record from a place like Korea where they add, you know, art to, uh, to making their videos and so on. And I think the open arms of the Latin American markets going forward is going to be really interesting. And I think all of those things could sustain in America. So if you, so, Waiting, for example, for the next Shakira to come out of, come out of Colombia, uh, all written by a local writer and local producer is very different. You could have an Argentinian artist like we have through our peer music affiliation. Uh, there's a Sony music artist named Fabian Manouk and our, two of our, um, writers pitch songs for that record along other great writers from the local market other international writers to try and make a great record that could potentially be released in mexico could be released in ecuador could be released in chile could be released in uh in other Latin American regions or in a place like Spain. But you know, if an artist like that gets to the United States, it could do it a lot quicker than just the old conventional way of, yes, we have the next Julio Iglesias and we're going to move him into America. Right. You know, there were uh, years ago, there used to be singers like uh, Iglesias, for example, who would sing in five different languages. They would sing in Dutch and French and in Spanish and in Italian and, and German, you know, even if they if they had the uh, audience base before going to English and trying to compete with everybody on th the global scale, I guess. Well, that was some really valuable pieces of information and insight coming from Vince on the growing opportunities that are available to you as a songwriter. So, insiders, here's the question of today. What were the most educational takeaways to you from our conversation with Vince? Was it the growing opportunities for songwriters in the international marketplace? Or was it the evolution of music publishing in today's music market? Or perhaps it was something else that connected with you. If you have any ideas or experiences that you'd like to share regarding this video, we'd love to hear from you and connect in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe to Mubu TV for more information on how to educate, empower, and engage your music career. You can also check out a summary of this episode and everything we talked about in the YouTube description as well. And if you enjoyed this video, we'd really love it if you hit the like button and let us know what other kinds of videos and types of content you want to see on our channel. Hit us up in the comments below, and we'll see you in the next video.